Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Batter, a podcast about how brands, business owners, and entrepreneurs rise. I'm your host, Jill Miller of Vera Creative, a small marketing firm in the Chicagoland area, where I'm also a part-time instructor of an advertising course at St. Xavier University. Join me as I hang out and talk to people who know all about the ingredients to success and the recipes for disaster. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Batter. Today, I am here with Beth Collada, owner of The Inn on Lake Wissota, a bed and breakfast located in Wisconsin. And before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody of a contest that we're running. If you snap a screenshot showing that you have subscribed to the podcast, post it to social media, tag at Vera Creative and two friends, you're automatically entered to win coffee or tea or whatever you like from Starbucks. And for the next episode, you could be sipping on some free beverage. So everybody make sure you enter the contest. Again, we do this uh, a giveaway every week. So keep on entering. Okay, so Beth, you own a bed and breakfast. Tell me a little bit about that. We have um, a bed and breakfast in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. So we're just north of Eau Claire. Um, and it's right on Lake Wissota, so hence the name, in on Lake Wissota. And uh, we bought the bed and breakfast uh, five years ago, and when we purchased it, it was called Pleasant View Bed and Breakfast. So it's been a bed and breakfast in Wisconsin on Lake Wissota for 24 years now. Oh, wow. Okay. I had no idea it was there. I grew up in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, but <laughs> I yeah. did not know that the bed and breakfast existed. So that was one of the things that was surprising to me when we first bought it that most of the locals didn't even know that it was here. It's like, oh, my gosh, we got a lot of work to do. So over the last five and a half years, we've done a great job and get more local people than we did when we first or bought it. Wow. Okay, so we'll definitely have to jump into how you grew the business. But let's talk a little bit more about the background. So do you have... Um, experience in hospitality or what led you to just making a decision of, hey, I'm going to buy this business? Um, I have no experience in hospitality. I left a perfectly good accounting job. Um, I had been an accountant for 20 years and actually it was a career that I chose um, when I was in my I, well, actually, I turned 30 and figured I needed to to uh, to get myself a job. I was very fortunate and was able to be a stay-at-home mom. With At that point, we had two children. Um, so I was a stay-at-home mom. And once those two kiddos got into school, I felt I had a lot more to offer than just sitting at home. So, um, And actually, by the time I turned 30, we did have our third child. So... Off to school I went and got myself an associate's degree in accounting and ultimately found myself working at a John Deere dealership and had fantastic um, mentors there, people who um, were very patient with me and I was ended up being the lead accountant reporting right to um, the owner and chief operating officer. So. It was a great gig. I just didn't I didn't really like accounting that much. It just wasn't a passion of mine. I didn't get a kick or a thrill out of reconciling checking accounts or preparing financial <laughs> statements or anything like that. I'm not a number numbers gal, so I can relate to that. <laughs> and so well, people, a lot of times, some people really are. So Yeah. And we need those people, so we're we're yes, thankful we that do. they're <laughs> that they exist. Yes, exactly. We do. One of the questions I also often ask entrepreneurs and business owners is, you know, what are some of the ingredients to success? And I feel like we can um, we can collect those ingredients as we talk. And the first thing I'm hearing is get a good mentor. And, and that almost is no matter what you do, whether you own your business or you're working for somebody else who owns the business, it keeps repeating itself uh, as I talk to different people in different podcasts. But you had a mentor, and this was before you even embarked on owning the bed and breakfast. Right. What was it about having a mentor, do you think, that, that just helped you prepare for everything else that kind of came your way in life? 
Um, my mentor, and you know, he may have set out to be my mentor. He was just a good, a good boss. So um, he he works very well with all kinds of people. You know, he he has to. He he was in charge of you know um, people who were in charge of you know parts salespeople and equipment salespeople and service technicians. So um, the accounting department obviously was also under his belt as well. So anyway, but he just, and in my mind, it just happened organically. And, you know, it's all a matter of mindset. So, and he had this great expression saying that a bucking horse don't pull. So either (laughs) you're on the team or you're not. And you have to make up your mind where you're at. There's no wrong answer to that question. But if you're on the team, great. Then you have to act like you're part of the team and help pull the cart. And if you're not going to be a member of the team, we wish you the best of luck, but then it's just time to move on. And he really wasn't um, trying to be harsh with that, but he was building a culture where everybody could work together and feel like they were working towards the same goal. Yeah, and that's a, that's challenging and one reason why I pretty much work alone <laughs> because it's hard mm-hmm. to manage all different personality types and to figure out mm-hmm. different things motivate different people. And as a good right. mentor, as a good boss, as a good manager, you have to figure out, I think, rather quickly what it is that motivates yep. the individual. So, yeah, that mm-hmm. that's um, those are some of the ingredients definitely to a great mentor, to a great boss. But like I said, it sounds right. like a lot of people will attribute uh, some of their success or their courage maybe to try and move on to something a little bigger and bolder to having a great Great. mentor. Yeah. So you worked in accounting and then, okay, now, now you own the bed and breakfast. So what was the transition like? What was happening in your life or maybe wasn't happening in your life? Um, I think it was more wasn't happening in my life. Um, all three of our kids were grown and and off living their lives, so we were empty nesters. And my husband has this passion for fishing, um, and everybody that I worked with loved selling John Deere equipment and parts, and they were all very passionate about that. It's like that's what I felt like I was missing was passion for for doing something in my life. And you know, I I was very active in our church, but that's only, you know, that doesn't fill up all your time. And it it fills a certain part of your cup, but it doesn't get you all the way there. You have to have a definite purpose in life. And I think everybody needs, it's important to keep yourself balanced in that regard um, to make sure you're not going to be fulfilled just by your job. You're not going to be fulfilled just by your volunteer work. You're not going to be fulfilled just spending time with your family. It's important to have all of those aspects in your life because that's really where, in my mind, where true happiness comes from is when you are, you know, touching each one of those and you feel like you are creating great relationships within each aspect of that of that part of your life. Uh, yeah, that's... Really, absolutely true, and I believe that as well. And I feel like it's it can be easy to dive into your career and have a little success in your career and then maybe just get kind of on a more narrow path where you think if I have more success, I'll be more fulfilled, more money, I'll be more fulfilled, more customers, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you get on this narrow path where you just want more of the same and that really never is fulfilling. You're right. You need a balance. You need a nice spread. I agree. Um, and I just was listening to um, a book. and I would have to look it up. But anyway, he was talking about these kinds of things, and he said, um, you have to know how much is enough. You know, what, and try to, try to have that determined sooner than later, because otherwise... Once you have it, you're not going to recognize it, 
Mm-hmm. And then you're still going to be wanting more and more and more. So try to have those things figured out sooner than later. And it takes time to figure it out. You know, it's not right. something that 20, most 20 year olds are not going to know the answer to that question. Yeah, I certainly Experience. wouldn't have, and I'm not sure I still do. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, um, that's right, and you don't want to be caught with your head down because you'll miss it uh, when, right. when that opportunity right. comes along or, you know, if you're exactly. so focused on one thing, you, you may miss the thing that could be very fulfilling to you. Um, so you were you you knew you were missing the passion piece, how did you mm-hmm. figure out that it would be owning a bed and breakfast? <laughs> well, it um, as I was working late in my office, and you know sometimes there's downtime while you're waiting for things to run in the background, and you just have time to kind of daydream a little bit. And <laughs> we had um, developed a great relationship with a couple that owns a bed and breakfast in just west of Manaqua, Wisconsin. Um, And they also have um, cabins, and we had rented a cabin from them every year for a number of years, plus stayed at the bed and breakfast. And it's like, oh, they provided such a great experience for both me and my husband, um, which isn't an easy thing to do. We don't always want the same kind of vacation, the same kind of time away to regenerate, you know, rejuvenate and reconnect with each other. but they did such a great job of, you know, both of us, my husband and I had stressful jobs. And, and when we would go there, we just, you, you just walk in the door and you just feel this peace come over you. And that is such a gift. And and that's what I wanted to do for people, too. I want to provide a place where people can leave the rest of the world behind, take time to reconnect with their loved one you know, have some great adventures and just time to recharge those batteries so that eventually we do have to, you know, go back to the rat race. But that's that's what I wanted to do. And it became more, you know, most women when they walk in the front door of the bed and breakfast was like, mm-hmm. oh, I've always wanted to run a B&B, you know. But once yes. they think about it for five minutes, they're like, okay, maybe not. Because it is <laughs> it's a huge commitment and it's a lot of work. But and I knew that, you know, I I absolutely knew it. But it became a yearning and a calling for me. So my parent, I talked to my parents about it first before I ever talked to my husband, and they really encouraged me. And then I got the courage to talk to my husband about it, and we did our homework. We did lots of homework. You know, we didn't just I didn't just go to work one day and quit my job. <laughs> it, it took several months before that actually happened so so I never really thought of hospitality I don't know why I didn't think of this but now it's very clear to me but I never thought of hospitality as an an industry where that would be like selfless but what I hear from your story is that I think it'd be really easy to walk into the bed and breakfast in Manaqua I believe is where you said you and your Mm -hmm. husband would rent and and attribute the feeling to the place versus the people, the getaway versus the people who helped establish the feelings, if, if you kind of get what I'm saying. But you went there and you really attributed your experience to the way the owners had set up the bed and breakfast. And then you thought to yourself, I want to give back. I want to provide this same thing. Yeah. So I guess that, and that, me, that sounds like just a unique perspective and a selfless perspective um, as uh, to why you would enter into being a business owner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, being able to interact with different people from all walks of life, that makes innkeeping really interesting. You just get all kinds of people coming through your front door. Right, and going back to what you said about your boss being personable, and you obviously have that quality as well, and I would think that that would be another ingredient to success, especially in your your industry. Yes, yep. 
Absolutely. So you decided, so, okay, it sounds like you had a lot of encouragement. I think that that's wonderful. Um, you know, my last podcast guest was kind of the opposite where people were telling him he was never going to make it. And so you had the opposite. You had people in your life who were supportive and encouraging. And you said you guys did your homework. What did that look like? What did the, the market research look like? Um, the market research looked like, um, you know, first of all, having a conversation with Ron and Anita, that couple from Manaqua, and saying, this is what I want to do. And um, they said, okay, just so you understand, this is what it's really like behind the scenes, you know. So yeah. they were pretty frank about some of the horror stories that they had dealt with. Um, and Wisconsin has a great... Um, Bed and Breakfast Association, and they put on an, um, an aspiring innkeeper seminar um, every year. So we attended that, um, got tons of reading material from that. And then, you know, they, it was, um, I think it was a one-day course, but you were there from like 8 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon, and they touched on, everything from how to make the bed to kinds of insurance you're going to need, the different amenities that you should think about providing. You know, they touched on every bit of it, even to the point where what's your exit strategy? You know, okay, you want to buy a bed and breakfast, but what's your exit strategy? It's like, geez, I don't even have the B&B yet, and now you want me to sell it. But <laughs> it was... But it's such a good point that you know you need to you need to consider this because trying to sell a bed and breakfast is not an easy thing to do, and it typically takes two or three years at least to get mm. a B and B sold, because most people are not looking for a home with five bedrooms and five bathrooms. <laughs> you know? Right, right. But that is a really good point, and I think it really right. translates into all businesses that to be successful, you have to have. You have to be in it for the long term. You have to have a long term vision. And yes, right. sometimes that looks like well, how do you get rid of the business? <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that sounds like that was a really wanted, helpful seminar. It was very helpful. And as much as I wanted to stay in the area where we lived at the time, we had raised our family there, had been there for 26 years. We just weren't finding um, the kind of you know the the home that we wanted i wanted first i wanted an existing business i didn't want to leave my perfectly good job and then have to start from scratch i wanted to be able to jump right in with an income stream um and i wanted it to be on the water so um actually rogers the one who found pleasant view in chippewa falls and we were living in osceola wisconsin at the time and like, I don't know if I want to leave all my friends that we've had for 26 <laughs> years. That's, you know, when you're in your 50s, that's not as easy thing to do to start over like right. that. Um, right. As when you're in but your But you have 20s, five beds and five bathrooms they can come visit. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, that's how you looked true. at it. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> when mm-hmm. you, you talked about when you first bought the business that none of the locals really knew that it existed. So what did you do that kind of turned it around? Well, that takes time. Um, And as you know, marketing takes money. So we didn't have a ton. We had time. We didn't have a ton of money. Um, So you have to be open to new ideas. Like you said, you can't have your head so far down that you're missing all the things that are passing you by. Um, We didn't change the name originally because I didn't want to fix anything that wasn't broken. I wanted to get in here and, you know, get the feel of it first before Mm -hmm. we changed anything. So um, we were here for about two years. Yeah, we were here for two years, two and a half. And I had the conversation with Roger. I said, we're doing okay, but if anything major happens, like a new furnace or a new roof, or we're going to be in trouble because it's it's not we're not getting that much business. And considering we're on the lake mm-hmm. and we have this fabulous view, we should be cooking with gas. 
You know, we should be doing better than we are. And um, I had joined the Wisconsin Bed and Breakfast Association, and they were doing um, a promotion, and um, there was this red chair that was traveling across the country, and it came through Wisconsin. And so I had it for a few days, and then I had to pass it off to another innkeeper. And so we met somewhere in the middle, and it turned out he has a marketing background, and he was wanting to supplement his bed and breakfast with a consulting business for innkeepers on how to grow their business. Hmm. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like exactly what I need because, you know, there's plenty of companies out there that will do the marketing for me. Um, Mm -hmm. They're very expensive. And we're very seasonal business here. Mm-hmm. And being in northern Wisconsin, it's not easy to get people to travel, you know, in January and February. Let's face it. It's cold. It's right. snowy. You know. So, anyway, um, I was his first client. And his first recommendation was to change the name. And I said, that's a fabulous idea. I'm on board with it. So, um, it, and there was a whole host of other things that we did, but basically we rebranded. Um, we make sure that you know we're seen on every available OTA that is out there. Um, and you just you got to get involved. You know, one of the first things I did was I joined the local Rotary Club so that we could meet some people from the area because our guests coming through our door are just here for a few days. They're not from the community. They, you know. They're very nice people, but they're not going to become friends of ours over the long term. Um, And then Roger joined the Elks Club, and, you know, you just get involved in the community, and you spread the word, you know, by doing good things. So it sounds like the rebranding took a – the rebranding had a big to-do with turning the business around and just getting out in the community and the ever-so-popular – Word of mouth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that rebranding, um, even though it was expensive, um, it was very effective. And the first year we um, increased our occupancy rate from under 30% per year to over 50%. And we've sustained that over three years. So wow, that's, um, that's phenomenal. This year is going to be a little different. COVID-19 had something mm. else to say about that, so we'll see, yeah. we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, well, and I would just like to touch on that a little bit because, again, in some of the other podcasts, it's just these themes keep coming up, but your brand is the first kind of touch point that you have with people, and it's either going to turn them on or turn them away. And so Mm -hmm. the feeling that just your logo and the colors and your website can, that all of the things that go into your branding, the, the, the impact and the first impression that it has on your potential customer is so extremely important. Um, not just from kind of that psychological view, but from the monetary view. Look at how much you were able to grow with uh, with some branding, and it sounds like you got your return on your investment. Yes, yes, you have. That's that's great. So let's talk about maybe that first realization when things didn't meet reality. You you know you <laughs> talked a little bit that you had a pretty good idea that things were not going to be all roses, but do you have any right. stories? <laughs> yeah, the thing I and it's not just one event, but the thing that surprised me the most is um, how isolating you can feel as an innkeeper because you know even though you're greeting guests and you're meeting new people. They're not really here to visit me. You know, they're not here to spend time with me. Um, They're here to reconnect with their loved one and go off and have adventures. And I get to see them at breakfast and hopefully, you know, out by a fire in the evening. But beyond that, you know, not a whole lot of interaction with my guests. So, um, Mm. and it's up to them. You know, they set the pace. How much do they want to have, you know, to get to know me, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So, um, yeah, that was that was like, huh, 
this is a little more lonely than I thought it would be. And um, part of that is because you're waiting around for guests to arrive. So uh, you only get one chance to make a great first impression. And for Mm -hmm. me, that's when I'm greeting them at the front door. And um, we have a set time for our check-in period. And not all guests can make it during that time frame, which is understandable. Um, but they aren't always good about communicating that. So then I would be sitting here waiting at, you know, 6.30 or 7 o'clock on a Friday night for guests to arrive, and you have no idea what time are they going to get here. Meanwhile, the friends are calling saying, let's go out for dinner, and you're like, well, I can't because I'm waiting for these guests to arrive. So um, we fixed, I don't know that we fixed it, but we've helped it for the guests and for us. We've had positive feedback on it they know we communicate to them they know if they're not going to be here by six o'clock that they will have a self check-in so we've got this keyless entry on the front door i program a code in for them they can let themselves in i leave a note on the door letting them know um, what their code is and how they can get in and where to find their room and and that takes the pressure off of them to get here you know, by 6 o'clock, if they're just leaving the Twin Cities at 4.30, they might not make it by 6, you know. And then I can make friend, plans with friends and not hold hold them up either. So, it's so Yeah, good. so there's a lot of gold in what you just said, I think. Um, you know, one thing, it sounds like if you're looking to make friends and host parties and, and be – uh, the the person that has this wonderful bed and breakfast, the host host might not actually. Is what we all yeah. want to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if that's your goal and you're looking for that friendship piece and that socialization piece to come from your job, again, it might not. And so that kind of goes back right. to what you were saying, where you can't put all your eggs in one basket and you have to have a good balance in your life. You, right. Even though you run yep. what appears to be a very sociable business, you still have to have a social life outside of that. You still have to have friends exactly. outside of that. Yeah, your guests, yeah. you're right, are not becoming your friends. Uh, do you right. get a lot of repeat guests, though? Um, each year we get more and more. Next week we have um, a couple coming to stay with us, and this will be their fifth time staying oh, with wow. us. Oh, wow, that's so great. We're looking forward to that. Yep. Yeah, that's really yep. great. And then the other thing that you said in there, you know, about your time as a business owner, your time is never your own. You're kind of right. always always on right. your client's clock. But at the right. same time, you you came across kind of a hurdle, and it sounds like you really dealt with it well. So how do we and, – and I think that's important as a business owner, that you have to be able to adapt. It might not have been – you might have wanted to have that greeting as a standard and a and kind of a policy that you did but when it wasn't working you were able to kind of leave that aside and right. say okay we'll go to a self check-in and 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 you've been getting right. good feedback for it so that probably tells you you know that you made a strategic decision right and you know customer service is key it's you know the customer has got to come first but when you live where you work you you really have to draw your line in the sand. You're willing to do that mm. and say, okay, this is this is my personal boundary, and I'm not gonna, I'm, you know, I'm just drawing my line in the sand here, and this is this is the way it's got to be, so that I can provide self care for myself. And that self care, you know, is going for a walk or spending time with my husband or, you know dipping into those other pots that we were talking about earlier, you know, friends and family and and spirituality and, you know, all of those other things that are just as important in your life. we just got to be careful that we don't let work and other people in the work realm tramp all over that. And and there is a way that you can you can do that and be respectful to those people and respectful for yourself as well. Yeah, I think that's a very well said and boundaries. I think a lot of business owners, I know me included, I have a hard time 
setting boundaries. I have a hard time saying no hard. to customers. Yeah, it, it it's like hard, it's going to yeah. be a lifelong lesson that I'm going to have to right. learn. I'm well, and so, you know, our our boundaries change too as life happens. You know, with your you have a daughter. Is that what you said? Yes, she yes, a twenty month old. <laughs> oh, fun. You know, the boundaries you need to set now might be different than when she's five or six. You know, you might have a little bit more freedom when she's in school or there might be more demands at different times during the day. You know, life changes and we have to be willing to adapt um, in order to keep up and to make sure that we're we're growing our business because we know what happens if we're not growing it. Right, exactly. So, yeah, and again, I I totally agree, and I think that that's one reason why people may not find success is when they're so resistant to change and they're so resistant to growth. Um, and I think that mm-hmm. happens just because it can be scary and, and it's unknown. Right. And people people want to know something is going to work before they try it, and that's not the attitude, <laughs> um, and that's not the reality of, of how things work. Sometimes no. you just have to jump in with both feet and you have to try them, and that's not to say you can't make a strategic decision or a smart decision. You can do those things at the same time, even though there might be a little bit of risk involved. Yeah. Do you have any examples of times when maybe you tried something and it and it didn't work? I think it must have been the first summer that we were here. We had a couple come stay with us. They were getting married. But she was keto. And I had not ever heard of keto before. I was like, what is this? So I did my research and I found a recipe or a quiche that was mostly vegetables. And you make the pie crust out of spaghetti squash. And so, oh, great, I can do this, you know, so... And she was going to get her hair done in the morning, so they wanted breakfast real early. So I delivered it to their room, and then she was gone, and then I saw him later. And I had actually tried that quiche after I delivered it to their room, and it was terrible. Oh, my oh, no. gosh. It was just <laughs> awful. <laughs> I saw him later and I said oh I'm so sorry that I served you that breakfast and he just kind of looked at me and I knew he felt the same way he didn't say anything bad about it but I knew he (laughs) felt the same way so I said I'll make it up to you tomorrow and so the next day I did make something you know I just fried her an egg or something and then I made him um, one of my more popular um, quiches and he wrote a little note the next day saying that that was awesome, and it definitely made up for the previous day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're not always going to get it right, you know, and I think it's important to show yourself a little bit of grace when that does happen, um, but try to recognize, you know, okay, what went wrong and how can I correct it? What, what can I do different to kind of redeem myself and get myself back on track. So I think it's important, you know, show yourself some grace, but you also have to make sure you're holding yourself to a higher standard. At least for me, that's important. I want to make sure I am doing the very best that I can with everything that I do here at the Bed and Breakfast. I want to be top notch. Yeah, and I definitely think that that's what will set you apart from others and in general what that sets how that sets apart the good right. owner the good business right. owners from you know you have you have that drive and it's not it's yep. intrinsic it's not for any yep. external motives but it's because you want to do it for yourself and the feel the way that it makes you feel um and i think that that's a quality that can't be taught <laughs> you have right. it or you don't yeah well I think I think you can get practice with it though too. You know, one thing um, in hospitality, we have ourselves out there on TripAdvisor, and anybody can leave a review. <laughs> so you feel like you're really exposing your belly. You know, kind of a crude way to put it, but you know, we're really putting ourselves out there, and um, people do leave bad reviews. There's just no way around it. But what I have discovered is 
they're usually crabbing about some little minute thing, you know, and it's all in how you respond to it. You have to respond to the review for sure. Yes. And it's all in how you respond to it. And people are savvy enough now, especially that we've been doing reviews for, you know, what, probably eight years now. Um, other people can read through, you know, they can they can see what's really going on and they understand. And then mm-hmm. I get comments saying, you know, Beth, I really appreciated how you responded to that guy who was mad at you because you didn't put a spoon on his tray. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So is that kind of what maybe one of the lows about owning a bed and breakfast is kind of the vulnerability Mm -hmm. in terms of the, you know, the business side of things, you do have to put yourself out there and open yourself up to critique and and potential criticism. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, What are there any other It's seasonal? I would think that that would also be, you have to make really smart choices with your income, uh, Mm-hmm. knowing that there's going to be a slower time ahead? How have you worked around that? Um, <laughs> well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so you do your best to try to do some tax planning, but you know, a lot of the projects that you want to do can only be done when the weather is nice. You know, They can't mm-hmm. be re-roofing in the middle of December when you figure, oh, yeah, we've got enough money now. Let's get this done this tax year. And that doesn't mm. doesn't work. So good point. Um, right. mm-hmm. And my husband is still working, so that really helps us out. And um, the bed and breakfast, the home is uh, forty three years old now, so it's requiring you know quite a bit of. Let's just say we're putting most of the money back into the B and B over the years. Yeah. That it's not you know it's not. Which is, I'm not even going to go there. Never mind. Um, <laughs> oh, but those are the things that make the best. Those are the things that make for the best stories. But I'll let you off the hook, and I will say Thank that you. A, a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the best business owners that I know pour a ton of their money back into yeah. the business, and and it is so that they can maintain the experience. For their customers Absolutely. that, that yep. they desire. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I think that that can yep. be surprising to a lot of people who are just starting out or have never owned a business before. They think that they're going to take all the money and run, but there's so much that you know, the business requires money to run. It doesn't run itself, and um, and things are expensive. I think it's very shocking when people, you know, start doing some research or talking to people about what it might cost to rebuild their website or what it take you know right. what it costs to take out a billboard for you know a four week period, so mm-hmm. yeah, I think that that can be really surprising to people just how much money the business is requires back from you, <laughs> right? And just how the hospital you know the lodging industry has changed so much even in the last five years. You know, six years ago, you kind of knew about Airbnb, but it certainly hadn't hit Chippewa Falls. You know, right. you couldn't find very many Airbnb. And um, within two years of us buying the bed and breakfast, three new hotels went up in the area. Mm. Mm. So there's That's right. a ton of, you know, a ton of inventory out there um, between, you know, ho- big, even big hotel chains are building smaller hotels, you know, in smaller communities like Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls. So that's putting more inventory out there. Airbnb has a lot of inventory out there. Um, so people are, are waiting till the last minute because they don't have to plan ahead for their vacation. They can, you know, look at the calendar on Wednesday and say, oh, let's go somewhere this weekend. And chances are they're going to find some place to stay, you know. Um, back in the early days of, of bed and breakfast, you know, in the 80s and 90s, innkeepers had their calendars full for the summer come come June mm-hmm. 1st. And that made it a lot easier to plan, you know, financially, you know, what projects could you get done. You know, you had a pretty darn good idea of what your cash flow was going to be. Right. So kind of another low, 
mm-hmm. another low yeah, but, you know, the industry is the it, competition. The, the level right. of competition has, has definitely increased. But I would mm-hmm. also think that with that, it would, it would force you to maybe target your marketing a little bit more because I just can't imagine that somebody that would be, listen, when I come home, I want to be on Lake Wissota. That is where I want to be. I grew up on that lake. I swam in the summer every day, all day on my grandpa's beachfront property. That property is no longer in the family, and it just devastates me that my granddaughter will not get to have that same beach experience that I had growing up. But so... In my head, well, you're you know, very I'm fortunate I'm, to have had <laughs> property with beach. That yeah, there's not many properties on the lake that have beach. There is not, and great. his probably yeah, his probably had the most beachfront. It was. Nice. I have chills right now just talking about this property. It was just <laughs> gorgeous great and. Memory. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful memories. And and so I can't imagine, though, that somebody looking to stay on the lake and have that type of experience, I mean, they'd really be settling if they booked one of those hotel rooms. So in terms of target market, I feel like at least there's that. There might be more competition, but um, um, right. among that, you're definitely reaching somebody who is there to experience the community, to experience right. the lake, to uh, yeah, I, I, for for a different, a totally different type of vacation yeah. versus so staying we're very in one of the hotels. In that regard, we are the only licensed and inspected um, bed and breakfast on the lake. The only licensed and inspected lodging. You know, there are a couple campgrounds, but um, there's no no other property like us on the lake. So. So I know you talked a little bit about that seminar that you took, but I also find it interesting because as a business owner, a lot of us start business and there's laws and rules and regulations and there's copyright Mm -hmm. and there's trademark and there's all these things that we never really Mm -hmm. probably thought about. And even, I mean, I have my master's in marketing and there was not one single legal course or anything that dealt with the legal side of marketing. And so I was actually talking one time to a department chair at the university that I teach at, and I was telling her that that was a huge part of what I thought would be really beneficial to the curriculum. And it it sounds like maybe were you surprised by any of the insurances or the regulations or licensing that you had to have, or did you kind of know about that stuff ahead of time? Um, I didn't. Until I took that course, I didn't know about any of that. While the insurance is is expensive, it's not as expensive as I had been thinking it would be. So that was kind of a nice surprise. Um, and I don't know why I thought it was going to be more expensive. Well, you have to um, get a license from the Department of Health. So mm-hmm. um, we're inspected once a year by the Department of Health. So you have to, and I just had to get my... Um, food manager um, service, recert- I just had to get recertified. So I have to, mm. even though I'm not running a commercial kitchen, I still have to get the same certification as somebody who's managing, you know, the local restaurant. Um, so, And that's a once every five years. So, you know, and sometimes I get a little irritated. Why do I have to know what? temperature everything on the buffet has to be. I don't do a buffet and I'm not serving <laughs> pork roast and you know but it's it's okay. I get it. It's all part of the deal. Um I kinda lost track of what the question was, Jill. I'm sorry. I don't even know what it was. Um <laughs> so the, it was just were you surprised kind of by all the the legalities, I guess you could oh, say yeah. that go into owning a business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We we live in a litigious society, so, you know, I mean, yes, it's endless. Even the state has an idea of how far back you should be turning, you know, when you make the bed. They want you to have hospital corners, and they want you to fold back that top sheet. I think it's 12 inches. Well, who's going to come and measure that? I don't know. <laughs> You never know. Somebody but that's might. state mandated. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. is nuts. Okay. There is a lot. 
that I have learned there is a just lot. in this conversation yeah. that I never would have thought about. And that's just it's amazing. But you're right, yeah. it is part of the deal. But again, I just think mm-hmm. it's so surprising to, especially maybe younger people um, who have never worked in the corporate world. And I think there's something to be said for having worked for a business owner or in a corporation Absolutely. before owning yeah. your own business versus yep. just starting out and just Jumping like, right in. here I go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm very thankful for my experience as an accountant. Very, very thankful. I would not trade my path to this dream job of mine at all because um, the training I had in the corporate world for how to ha- handle a difficult customer, how to, you know, um, just present yourself in a very professional manner and, and not be all over the board with your emotions, you know, it can kind mm. of make, be a steady eddy. Um, I think that's a lot easier. I, for me, that was something I had to learn over the years through my corporate experience, so. Very I, I agree yeah. with that. I, I definitely remember, you know, different people when I was first getting started reminding me to kind of take the emotion out, which is very hard for mm-hmm. me. I'm a pretty emotional person. You usually know exactly what I'm thinking by the look on my face. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't hide it well. Um, so, right. so, yeah, you're right, though. That That's definitely another lesson as a business owner Business is business, and you sometimes you just can't take it personal, and you have to have some pretty thick skin if you want to be in this right. game of of ownership. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and and we touched, I think, on this in different ways. But do you think that you like? What do you think one of the biggest myths about being an entrepreneur is? <laughs> oh, um, there's several things, but you know, like we talked about before. Um, being in charge of your own schedule. You know, your time is your own. Well, no, it's not. Um, and you you have to wear so many different hats. You know, I'm not just the innkeeper. I'm the head groundskeeper and the maintenance supervisor and the bookkeeper. And, you know, you have to wear a lot of different hats, especially when you're first starting out because you can't afford to hire all those people. Um, I'm fortunate that, you know, I've got some teenagers that help me out on the weekends, and then I've got another um, woman who helps out, especially during the school year, during the week, because there's not enough hours in the day, and even if there was, I would be so physically tired from cleaning, you know, three to four rooms every day that Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have the energy to to do the other things that need to be done, so... um, your, t- your time is not your own, and you want to make sure that you um, are doing as much as you can, um, but then be willing to delegate, you know, and hopefully you've got the funds to, to delegate and get some, let the professionals take care of what they can do best. Yeah, then that's the second time that that's come up in a podcast as well, just in terms of, so... Your time is not your own. Um, you wear so many different hats. And within that, a lot of the time you spend on your business is time in areas that you don't love. <laughs> so oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. yeah, so there might be the myth that you're just going to spend all this time on the parts you love, but there's so many other parts that have to get done. And mm-hmm. yes, it's nice when you can delegate and hire out, but you can't always afford to, especially in the beginning. Right. Um, but and you have to pick and choose, and you have to know, again, I say strategically, which ones make sense for you to hire out, and which, and usually those are, are the ones that you're not strong in, the areas that you're not right. so strong in. Right, you need in. to understand yeah. where your weak link is, yeah. For me, it was marketing, you know, accounting people don't, don't do marketing, you know, obviously, mm-hmm. so that's where my weak link was, and that's where I got some help, and, um, you know, Quite frankly, I wish I could afford some marketing person to come in here and just help me out with a few things. You know, I can do things, but I don't always know if they're good or if they're effective. 
you know, just having somebody to kind of look over my shoulder and say, oh, Beth, if you just do this, you know. Yeah, yeah and I think that's that where... Working in a corporation, you have other people to get feedback mm-hmm. from. When you, you know, you're part of a big team, um, even if you're working on a project by yourself, you're still ultimately getting feedback from other people on how that's going. Um, but when you're an entrepreneur, especially solo entrepreneurship, you know, you get to consult with yourself and that's about it. (laughs) Right, right. Well, you get really good at making decisions (laughs) or, you know, Mm -hmm. and a lot of times you have to make decisions with limited information. um, Right. If, you know, for, for whatever reason, but, you know, it's a good point that you make because I think a lot of business owners think, you know, I can post to Facebook or I can, um, post to Instagram or I can make this flyer or whatever it is, the marketing that they're going to take on because you can physically do it or you have the time to do it may not mean you have the depth of understanding to do it in a way that actually results in more customers, results in right. consistency, results in communicating effectively with the right people in the right place at the right time. And I think mm-hmm. I know that probably one of the most frustrating parts of my job is that, you know, in, a, in any situation, you have to convince people that they need you. And sometimes it can be very hard for me to convince people because they think, well, oh, you're just going to post a Facebook for me. I can do that. But there's a lot more that goes in behind the scenes, just like any other job. And that's why, I, you know, I love these podcast interviews because I'm finding out a lot more of the behind the scenes work that goes into everybody else's job. And I can truly appreciate that knowledge. And I get to share a little bit too about, you know, what goes on behind the scenes for me as well. So let me ask you, um, I've been kind of asking people if they have any ridiculous or silly or funny stories. And I know you already shared your quiche story. um, And I thought that was kind of, that was fun. You shared that as you know, you kind of considered that as a, a little bit of a failure and how and, and shared how you overcame that. But is there any other story you have? Or maybe it's not your own, but it's somebody else's. Kind of a juicy piece of gossip. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Oh, we did have... If not, that's okay. <laughs> yep, no, we did have a, um, a priest come and stay with us one time. And he was coming in April, and it turned out that the day he was driving up, it was a snowstorm. And and we had known this snowstorm was coming for, you know, they had been predicting it all week. So the day before the snowstorm hit, I emailed all the guests who were scheduled to arrive. I said, if you want to come early, that's fine, just. You know, your room might not be ready for you, but please get here as soon as you can. And if nothing else, you can just hang out in the common area until we're done cleaning your room. Um, but just get here safely. If yeah. So anyway, um, I was I had to go somewhere, and my husband was um, home, and all the guests had arrived except for this one. And he was, Roger was out in the driveway, and this little Prius pulled into the driveway, which had like 10 inches of snow in it, <laughs> and it barely got up the driveway and into the parking spot. And um, this gentleman got out of the car, and he looked at Roger, and he said, when the hell are they going to plow that goddamn road? <laughs> I don't know if I can say that on, on your podcast. But. That's fine. <laughs> Well, so, and Roger didn't know that there was a priest coming. So he he told the gentleman, he, he said, I don't know, I'm waiting for them to plow so that I can plow our driveway once they, you know, pile it up at the end of our driveway and I can right. get it all cleared out. So anyway, he says, come on in, you know, we'll get you checked in. And, and I always write the guest name on this little piece of paper with their code for the front door. And so I had written on the piece of paper, Father Chuck. <laughs> so he's having this gentleman sign the guest book and Roger says, So you must be and he kinda looks at the paper and he says, Oh, Father Chuck 
And Father Chuck said, oh, yeah, sorry about the swearing. <laughs> so what was really interesting about Father Chuck was this was his second career. He had gone to seminary when I think he was late 50s or early 60s. Um, but prior to that, he had been um, a probation and parole officer at Cook County oh, wow. in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, holy cow, that is a total different, that's a 180, totally different lifestyle. My God. Yeah. But that that happened two years ago, and we're still laughing about that one. Actually. Well, trying to get a Prius through with a Wisconsin snowstorm can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see why he had some choice words. <laughs> yeah. And he had no idea that it was supposed to snow. It's like, well, where the heck have you been? They've been pretty <laughs> yeah. so. That's so funny. Oh. Thank you for sharing that story. So let's you recap. Bet. Let's recap. The ingredients to success. We've talked about time. We've talked about, you know, just that the marketing takes time, the business growth overall takes time. So I would, so like patience, we would probably put in our recipe, do you think? (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Grace, I know that was another thing that you talked about. Yeah. Passion. Um, Passion, time. Self-discipline, I think, is pretty important, too. Mm. And we didn't really talk about that too much, but. There's going to be a lot of things going on, and those mundane things have to be done. And having having the self discipline to get those mundane things done is key to success. You're right about that, and it's interesting to me because I didn't think that things would be repeating themselves as much as they are through these interviews. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that some of these things that I know that I've put a lot of time in and spent a lot of time in and the lessons that I've had to learn are the same lessons as other people have also had to right. learn in the same areas of time that, yeah, that they've had to learn. So, so you're not alone. Oh, no, and you know, another good thing that we talked about is a mentor, having a good mentor. Mm-hmm. Yep. As as being yeah. one of the and recipes. I don't know how you go out. I don't know how you go out and find one. To me, that just kind of happens organically, you know. Um, yeah, I you agree. are fortunate and enough to. I think when you recognize that person, you know, then you got to kind of jump on it and say, "Listen, you know, I could really use some help, and I think you might be able to to do that." Right. You don't walk up to somebody and, you know, hi, I'm Jill. Will you be my mentor? It's not necessarily (laughs) that type of relationship. Um, No, I agree. That's something that also takes patience and you got to keep your eyes and ears open and be looking for that person that you can really learn from and um, Mm -hmm. absorb as much information and wisdom um, as they're willing to share with you. So this has been wonderful getting to know you, Beth, and, and a little bit about your husband and your family and your story of how you moved to Chippewa Falls and um, you, you took a business and you turned it around and it's successful. And so I'm really excited. I hope to be able to stay or at least have some in-laws stay with you the next time we're all visiting Chippewa. That would be well, really yeah. fun. Next yeah, time you're in really Chippewa, fun. I sure hope you come in, come in and at least stop by and say hello. Yeah, I will. I, I will. Let's tell our listeners where they can find you. Are you on social media or your website? Sure. Um, we are on social media. We are on Facebook and um, Instagram. I, I don't tweet. I mean, I have a Twitter account, but please don't go <laughs> Um, but the best place to go and get as much information about the bed and breakfast is our website and that's going to be in on lakewisota.com I will put the link to your website in our um, comments in our notes for the episode so people will easily be able to find you and I'll also uh, link the Facebook and the Instagram accounts as well yeah so Beth thank thank you. you 
so much for your time today. Again, I really appreciated getting to know more about you and your business and all the fun stories that you share. I hope everybody else enjoys them as well. And just again, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Jill. It's been a lot of fun.